Luke chapter 15, verse 11. Then Jesus said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided them to his livelihood. He got his inheritance early. It's kind of nice. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and sent him into his fields to feed swine. Those are pigs. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. No one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, you know, you have to come to yourself at some point. He said, now some people think, well, God will put you in some terrible pig, you know, farm uh, till you call on him. But no, no, the father didn't put him in there. Amen. His decisions put him in there. That's how it is. Even though the glory of it may be wonderful afterwards, you can't, you can't assume or, or blame it on God that he put you there. He didn't put you there. He'll pull you out of there. He didn't put you there. Well, it was God's plan, his sovereign designed plan to have me go through all of these. No, it wasn't at all. It wasn't at all. A good father wouldn't do that. Even to teach the kids something, a good father wouldn't, wouldn't throw you in the pen to, to have you call on him so he can be, you know, the savior for you. That's, that's weird, isn't it? I always say that's like a boyfriend hiring a thug to mug the girlfriend. And the boyfriend jumps out of the bushes at the right time and saves the girlfriend and it's all wonderful. She loves him. No, he tricked her. <laughs> and so don't do that with God. Don't assume that God put you through a bad thing so he could do a good thing and then you'd love him more. That's tricky. That's wrong. God's not like that. It goes against his nature and his character. So anyway... Verse 17, but when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Basically just ignored, ignored his stupidity. You need to realize God will ignore your stupidity. Okay. Thank you, Lord. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. Mm -hmm. And the father said, Yes, grovel to me a little bit more and then I will give thee. <laughs> no, he didn't say that. The father said to his servants, he just kind of ignored the whole thing. He, you know, he sees the heart of the son. He recognizes there's repentance there. He doesn't have to go through the whole motions of it. He just says, bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Hallelujah. 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 So if you've, if you've run off, if you've been lost, if you have walked away or never been there, Realize if you'll come to God, he'll accept you. He'll, if you come to him, he'll accept you. When I came back to the Lord in my 20s, I felt so good. I felt so accepted. I, you know, I thanked God and I still thank God for letting me back in the kingdom. Hallelujah. For letting me back in. And whether or not I was all the way out or partially, I don't really know. But I know I felt like I was in. And it felt really nice. And so I appreciated the Father for letting me in and, you know, not holding me over the fire and threatening me and all that kind of thing. You know, you come to your senses and you come back to him. Amen. Amen. Verse 25. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother's come. And because he's received him safe and sound, your father's killed the fatted calf. Which is a big deal. You know, you keep the, the calf and your precious thing and you're fattening him up for a future, you know, celebration. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you. I've, been, I've never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who's devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. You ever felt like that before as a Christian? How does, how come they get, and how come I'm, and how come they, and why not me, and I, I, I thought I was the, you know, and we just kind of complain and look at comparisons and all that. 
Verse 31, and he said to him, son, you're always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make Mary and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. Which is, you know, the main basic theme of this chapter here. But verse 31, son, you're always with me, and all that I have is yours. And we believers need to realize that with God. We're the children of God, and all he has is already ours. We don't need to wait for some day when God specially chooses to give us the fatted calf. When's my ship going to come in, God? He's saying, all I have is yours already. This son could have got the goat any day. He could have had a party with his buddies more than once, I'm sure. But he didn't realize what belonged to him. We believers need to realize what belongs to us. And that's what we're talking about today. God, everything that God has, every, everything that he is, is ours. Anybody want a goat? You can have a goat. It's a literal translation. You can have the goat. Right? Or what would a goat represent? You can have those things. Any things you, you need or like or desire, you can have those things. Not, not some weird, you know, you're not, not talking about just some spoiled brat. You know, there's a lot of Christians that kind of treat God that way. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about rightfully taking uh, or experiencing the things that are already ours. Let's turn to a couple of scriptures here. Go to 1 Corinthians with me. Christians are doing a lot of praying for things that are already theirs. And it's okay to ask and you're commanded to ask. And if you don't ask, you're not going to get. But be careful about how much begging we do or how much acting like it's not there we do. Sometimes we're praying to God for this thing that we, like it's this, you know, huge monstrosity of need that, oh my gosh, how is this ever going to happen? Well, it's already yours. It's, if God has it, it's already yours. Everything he has is ours. Right? We've inherited all things. When did we inherit those things? When the one who owned them died. Jesus died. He's the, the death of the testator. It means we get the inheritance. Isn't that wonderful? You already have the inheritance. You're already blessed with, it, or with all blessings, spiritual blessings in heavenly places. It's just a matter of our faith pulling them into this material world or in this natural world. Amen? Sure, we, we get them in heaven, but you can have them now if you can do it by faith. You can believe you can have those things now. Well, I don't see them. Well, you've got to use your faith. You have to believe God for these. You have to know what belongs to you, expect what belongs to you, and get the butcher to get the knife to get the goat, you know, on the table. Your faith is required to get these wonderful blessings and promises to you. It means you have to believe God. You have to believe that these are yours, that they're not so far away, that when you ask for a thing, you get it. Rather than asking and waiting and hoping and wishing and wondering. Right? So these are all things of faith that we have to know. Look at 1 Corinthians 3. Verse 21. Therefore let, let no one boast in men. For all things are yours. You can underline that in your Bible. It's not a sin to underline in the Bible and write in the Bible. Write, a, write all over the Bible. Make notes. Underline so you can find things. Star. Highlight. Whatever you do. Amen. Amen. For all things are yours. All things. What does he mean? All things are yours. Verse 22. Whether Paul, he's yours. Whether Apollos, he's yours. Whether Cephas or Peter, he's yours. Whether the world or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, it would be good to go home and think about that. Right? So he said, the Bible says, all things are yours. So I'm yours. I'm yours. Aaron is yours. You need him, he's yours. Right? I got a little gas money, it's yours. If you need it, I got it. And I don't have that much. Everything God has is ours. All the preachers are yours. All the churches are yours. You know, when I got in the kingdom of God, I just felt like every church was mine. I have a right to go in every single church building. I know that the culture says, oh, you got to do all this proper thing. But to me, it was all mine. 
I'm in the kingdom. I'm a brother. I go, I go into people's churches during the day and look around at things and talk to people and just so happy. Go look for the pastor. Hey, you just want to say hi to the pastor. Now, don't, don't you all do that in the same day. I realize that you don't always get access to the pastor, but, you know, maybe you get lucky and bump into him, right? And I know we don't believe in luck. Okay, okay. Fortunate, fortunate, blessed. Okay, favored. Okay, okay. <clears throat> it's just a different attitude, you know. Okay, so we need 500 extra bucks this week. Oh, it's, it's ours. See, now we're going to pull it in closer. That's right. You know, I started this thing and when I needed 134 or 43, I can't remember now, $134 for a wedding. I had a special thing coming up. I had to buy a present. I had to, you've heard me tell the story. I had to uh, play in the golf tournament, the, 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 the bachelor party with my buddy. I was in the wedding party, you know. And so we had the bachelor party. And, of course, we did, I did the day thing. They said, you can go to the, do the day thing with us. And you don't have to go to the night with us. I said, thank you very much. <laughs> And I needed a gift, and I needed to rent a tux, and it totaled about 134, 143, I can't remember which. And I needed it, so it's mine. So I asked the Lord, it's mine. Okay, thank you, Father, I need this, big deal, you know. And the money came in, Amen. extra money. You think all you needed was 100, yeah, that's, all, that's what I needed. And back then, I didn't have it. Amen. And so I just remember building this attitude of, you know, if we, if we need it, we'll have it. Amen. When we need it, we'll have it. If we need it, we have it. If we want to do this, we can do it. Yes. So it, it kind of broke me free from the, oh, my gosh, we're never going to have enough, and I don't know if we're going to have enough, and I don't know if we can plan that, and I don't know if we can do this. You just, can't, you just got to live the opposite. Yes, you got to right. plan the thing, that's do right. the thing, then the money's there. That's right. that's you can't right. wait for the money and then do the thing. It's just a different attitude to realize, well, it's mine. Glory. Jesus needed an upper room. It was there. Yes. He needed a donkey. Boop, there's one. <laughs> Perfect donkey. No one ever sat on it. Hey, we need some tax money. Oh, okay, no problem. Go fishing. We get some. Amen. Oh, and then take the, take the coin out of the fish's mouth. Huh? Yeah, just do it. We'll have it. Amen. It's just a different outlook, isn't it? Yeah. Jesus used this outlook. Come on. Hey, we need to feed all these 5,000 people, but we don't have any money. We don't. How, much, how much do we have? Oh, we only have a few. Well, let's, let's get it blessed. Here, just give me that. Here, you take this, you take this, and you just divvy it out to all the 5,000 people. Huh? Jesus just had a different way about him, didn't he? Yes. Never panicked. He just believed that all things was his. He knew who he was. It's just a different attitude, and it all begins with attitude. Amen. Or revelation. Okay, revelation in the heart causes a different attitude on the inside of you, which allows God to freely move with supernatural blessing and favor and miracles and all sorts of things. It starts on the inside of us believing it's all ours anyway. Amen. Isn't that right? Verse 23, and you are Christ, and Christ is God's. And so, yeah, it's all God's, and it's also all ours, and it's all Jesus's, right? <coughs> Praise God. Turn with me to Psalm 23. These are all things concerning the covenant of God. He made a covenant, an agreement. And in a covenant, that's what you get. You get everything that they have. Amen. When two men made a covenant in the Old Testament, or in old times, in history, it was... I, I'm going to shake your hand or, or we're going to be blood brothers. And that means my family's yours. Yours is mine. I'll protect you. You protect me. I'll give to you. You give to me. My life is yours. Your life is mine. We're exchanging this thing and it's all done. I'll live for you. I'll die for you. I'll fight for you. Right? right. So God made a covenant with the human race. It's all ours. Mm -hmm. He gets your life. We get his life. It's a big exchange. Lord. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Now, let's try not to read it with our religious ears on. We've heard it so many times, right? All the movies, right at the point of death. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to die. <laughs> let's look at it as, as the Lord speaking to us. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want or lack. So there, I don't lack. He's my shepherd, I don't lack, I get to eat. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. 
These are also wonderful if you need restoration in your soul, if you've been hurt, if you've got things in you. He'll restore that. Open it up to Him and say it. Open that up to Him in your heart and say it. Restore me from this. Restore me, restore me, restore me. Open it up, use your faith and ask Him and then watch what happens. Thank you, Lord. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yes, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rot Notice all these things you get with Him. He's your shepherd. You don't have to fear any evil. I said you don't have to fear any evil. You don't have to fear any evil. You don't have to fear any evil. You don't have to fear any bad things. You don't have to fear the stock market crashing. You don't have to fear next month. You don't have to fear the court case. You don't have to fear the people. You don't have to fear the opinions of people. I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, your power. Your direction, they comfort me. Verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That's an interesting one. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Some people have read Psalm 23 as if it's like So we're waiting on heaven. Yes, there's green pastures there and there. It's wonderful. But here it says you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Where You don't have any enemies up there. So you're not talking about heaven. You have enemies here. And you have to realize, even though there's calamities all around and there's stuff going on all around, there's demonic forces against your life all around, right in the presence of your enemies, you get to go to the big banquet table. So all believers, all believers can have a full supply of food all the time. Okay? Let's just start with food. I mean, some of you need to start with food and feel like I have plenty of grocery money every single month. You ought to see my cupboards. You ought to feel this way. Let's go ahead and just apply it to a basic thing, then we'll move upward. Right? So right in the presence of your enemies, you get to eat. And then let's go spiritual with it. Right in the presence of this fallen world, you get to have the blessing of God. Amen. You get to have joy. You get to Amen. have peace. You get to be healed right in the presence of sickness and disease. Glory. You get to be delivered from things. You get to have joy from the Holy Spirit yeah. right in the middle of this thing. Thank you, you apply it to the prosper prosperity right in the middle of this crazy recession stuff. Uh, you don't have to feel it. You don't have to feel it. You can live on the top of the barrel. You can live on the bottom of the barrel uh, or you can live on the top of the barrel. You can spend the same. Just live... Which side of the barrel, which end of the barrel do you want to be on? You can spend and, and spend the same amount. Uh, let's just fill the barrel up first. Or how do you do that? Well, you do it in your heart first. You start seeing yourself full rather than empty. It'll, you'll get there. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. My cup runs over. That's a good goal. Have your cup running over rather than leaking out. Most people would say, yep, my cup's leaking out again. <laughs> Most people feel that in their heart that their cup's always leaking. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Yeah. And I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, verse 6, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I know that a lot of people feel like, you know, what's following me ain't goodness and mercy. Well, how, you, how do you resolve the difference? How do, you, how do you cross the bridge? How do you get from A to Z? I mean, how come it says such wonderful lofty words, but yet so many believers don't have it? Is, is, just, is this just a poem? Is this just an encouraging thing that never really works anyway? Just kind of fuzzes us over so we can make it through the day? Or can goodness really follow me and mercy follow me? I believe it's really, it really can happen. So the question is, why doesn't it so often? And it's because of the belief in our heart. That's really all it is. It's because we don't see it in our heart yet. We, we can't experience it. We can't connect with this covenant promise. We can't access God's blessing and favor and hand just because we don't know or we don't believe. Or we just read this whole passage with religious ears, right? Just memorized it. And it was just kind of a, a, a ritual that we did rather than grasp, grasp each statement of promise to us. So all, all things of faith and supernatural blessing from God depend on, depend on knowing 
precise truth and believing it. And so we need, you need to be able to wake up and think, goodness and mercy is following me today. The, the end, end result of getting into faith about it is that you're waking up thinking, goodness and mercy is following me. No evil shall befall me today. Goodness and mercy, uh, rather, is following me. Right? It's just a different way to look at it, a different way to think, you know, where God's your, your friend, actually. He's your partner. He's with you. Right? Fear, fear no evil, because I'm with you. Don't be afraid, because I'm with you. Though the valley's dark, doesn't matter, because I'm with you. And even in the dark valley, we can all have a banquet table. Can't promise for all your friends and all the stuff around you, but I can promise for you. God's not promising to fix all the world troubles and give us world peace. He's not promising that. He said right in the middle of non-peace, you can have peace. And that's, that's what we're after here. Turn with me to uh, Matthew 15. Matthew, first book of the New Testament. The easiest one to find, except for Genesis and Revelation. <laughs> if you've never read the Bible uh, ever, or the New Testament really particularly, uh, Matthew is a good place to start. Okay? Some people say read John first, that's fine, that's good. Uh, I read Matthew first, it changed my life. Um, you can read Luke first, you can read Mark first, fine with me. I, I'd say start with one of those four and uh, get reading the New Testament. Yeah. Amen. Maybe I ought to do, talk about that some more, about reading the Bible. <laughs> Everybody's gone quiet to talk about reading the Bible. Maybe you've already read the Bible. You ought to read the whole New Testament four or five times, two or three times, uh, you know, over a year time or something like that. And then later read the, the whole, a whole Bible, the Old Testament too. But you want to get the New Testament in you first at least so that you can uh, interpret the Old Testament properly. Because things change. Old Testament's the Old Covenant. New Testament's the New Covenant. We have a New Covenant established on better promises. The new, it's called a better covenant actually. The New Covenant is better. Covenant and Testament, same thing. Same exact word. New Covenant's better than the Old Covenant. Right? Yep. So how many of you like driving an old car better than a new car? No, we like new cars. And I know if you have a classic. <laughs> but it, it better be restored new. <laughs> See, I know all the loopholes. Okay. <laughs> you start trying to loophole me, I will get you back. <laughs> so we're in the New Testament. And so you've got to know the New Testament real, real, real well. But we need to read the, you need to read the whole Bible for sure. Sure. Absolutely. Matthew 15, verse 21. Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. And then Jesus panicked and rushed over to find the problem. <laughs> you know, we, we humans panic a bit, but Jesus never really panicked. And so it kind of shows you how to act when things go on. If you know God, then you can act differently. Uh, but he answered her not a word. He kind of ignored the thing. And, you know, you felt that way before. You're presenting some great case to God. <laughs> and you don't get a response. And it's like... Well, he's ignoring me. I know you felt that way before. He answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, meaning I, I, I can't talk to her. I wasn't really sent to her. I was sent to the Jews. What? I thought he came for all people. Well, he did, but he first came to the Jews. Jesus' ministry was to the Jews. It was to present them the Savior of the world, the Savior they waited on, the Messiah they waited on. Now, there was a few like her uh, who were non-Jews that actually pulled the blessing, got healed, got the blessing, got to walk with him. He let people in if they wanted it, but he also made sure that they wanted it. And you see the principle here that 
You know, there's a time when you might feel ignored from heaven, but it's to pull you out into faith. Anybody can just talk about their needs, but it's another person that believes that they can get their need fulfilled. And so going after God until is the secret. Well, I cried. I've explained everything that was wrong and nothing happened. No, go a little further and believe that what was wrong can be fixed by your Heavenly Father. And so that's all Jesus did. He just kind of ignored it for a moment. And, you know, there's a time to do that. There's a time to do that. <clears throat> but he answered and said, I was not sent except to the Jews, basically. Verse 25, then she came and worshipped him. She's not going to give up here. And I encourage you not to give up. There's something you need or desire. Uh, don't give up. The only people that don't get miracles are those that, that don't give up. Uh, they give up. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Yeah. Yeah. Then Jesus answered and said, Oh, woman, great is your faith. Meaning you put up with a conversation that was pretty difficult. Yes. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. So notice how Jesus was looking for faith. He found her faith. Oh, great is your faith. He's looking for that from us. Somebody that will just be determined. Make a decision. Be determined. I'm not leaving because I know you. You got it, man. I'm, I'm taking it. Yes. All things are mine. I'm showing up to the table. I'm expecting to eat. And I'm just not going to leave the table till I'm full. And God says, ah, great is your faith. You look at your empty bank account for so long, you just expect an empty bank account, and you fret over an empty bank account, and you wonder about the empty bank account. At some point, you've got to decide that's not going to be empty anymore. I'm going to get the bills paid and all the things out and out of debt, and I'm going to, I'm going to overcome this thing because my Heavenly Father said my cup can run over, so therefore my cup's going to run over. So I'm just looking at a running over cup, and so I'm going to go run over my cup, and I'm going to just go look at this thing, and I'm going to go pour some water in a cup and just watch it run over. And then I'm going to go pour a bucket uh, in some, some water in a bucket and watch that run. No, I'm just going to get an image of running over. Amen. Those are things of faith that will help you start picturing a different lifestyle. Amen. And what that does with God is it lets him see, oh, you're kind of determined there to have a promise that I've already laid out for you. Oh, you really do want me to run your cup. Oh, great is your faith. Bam. Bam. That's how it happens. I'm telling you, that's how it works with God. It's happened so many times to us. It starts here. It starts with a mental image. It starts with a revelation. It starts with a desire, a dream, a decision, a faith that says, Yes, God will. I must have. He said, Yes, yes, amen. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. But notice verse 26. Jesus answered and said to her, It's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Gentiles were called dogs. They were the outsiders. They were not in the covenant or the family covenant. The Jews are called the children. They were the children of promise. Now everyone who believes in Jesus is a child of promise. But then the Jews were the chosen people. Only the Jews. And they were called the children. Okay? Jesus said... I can't take what belongs to the children, the Jews, and give it to the Gentiles, the dogs. And then she came up with a good, wise statement. But even the dog can get something. Now, you're not called a dog now. That's just what they did before Jesus died and rose from the dead. It's true. It's true. No Gentile is called a dog. Right? And, and no unbelieving Jew is called a child. No, only those who have received Jesus are called children of God. Absolutely. But notice what he said. I can't take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. The children's bread. What does that mean? Well, I believe it means this. That the children's bread is the thing that sustains children. We can say the children's food. Any parent that has children is required by a, a, an unspoken obligation on the inside of them to always feed their children. You would go without your own food before you let your child starve. Yeah. Children have a right to eat. Humans have a right to eat. Parents know this about their children. God knows this about us. 
Okay? Yeah. So God knows we got to eat food physically. <laughs> Parents know their children have to eat food. You would, a, parent, a good parent would never withhold food from their child. I mean, unless it's junk food, too much junk food, you know, I understand. But you, you, you never punish your child by, by not feeding them at night. Okay? Never, never would a good parent ever withhold food as a punishment. You with me? Amen. And if you've ever done that, just repent. Don't ever do that. That's harsh. It's wrong. And it's not, it's not of God. Okay? Children get to eat. And I think of a child in a home. child busts through the door after playing outside, runs straight to the refrigerator. They're hungry. Right? Yeah. The children get to eat the food in the house with a few limitations, with a few regulations. Not limitate, regulations, right? I understand that. But you get the cupboard. I mean, the cupboard is yours. Whatever the father has in the house, whatever the parents have in the cupboards and the refrigerator is yours. Isn't that right? Yeah. Same thing with God. Whatever he's got is yours. You're a child, you get to have it. Hallelujah. Now let's tie it to what this passage is all about. It's about healing, isn't it? Isn't it about healing? Yes. Deliverance for the daughter? So the child, the children's bread particularly is healing. God would never withhold healing from a child. God would never withhold healing, divine healing from a, ch from a Christian. It's part of living. Divine health and healing is part of living. You must know this. Divine health and healing is not something we strive to hopefully get one day. No, it's just as easy as a child getting some food. He doesn't have to strive and hope for food. He just gets it and eats it. Yes. Healing is the same way. You just get it. Lord. Christians just get to be healed as part of the family deal. Hallelujah. Yeah. Healing is the children's bread. God. Healing is what we get by default for being a child. Amen. It's not supposed to be extremely hard. We just simply open up and say, okay, I'm healed then. I'll receive that from God. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So we don't have to make it some mystical thing or some extra spectacular thing. Just accept it and, and walk off expecting to be delivered and healed. We've got to make these things easier for us because we've kind of complicated everything. Healing is the children's bread, so just go eat. And if you have to take a piece of bread and do an act of faith and say, I've got healing in this bread, this is my bread, I get to eat this bread and just eat. And that's why we've done that in, in communion time. We take that, that piece of bread and we say, okay, by his stripes I'm healed. When I eat this, I will be healed. Yes. So use your faith. Act on this. Get it in your soul. Think about it. You know, there's a term I like to use called work it out in your soul. I didn't make up that term, but it just seems like a great term. Work it out in your soul to where you believe that healing is easy. Amen. To where you believe it's just as easy as a child getting a cracker out of the cupboard. Yeah. Or a cookie out of the cookie jar. How about cookies? Let's just get a cookie out of the cookie jar. You know, we got this image in our mind that, oh, God's going to withhold all those things, you know, until I'm perfect or something. No, you're a child of God. You just go eat the healing. Get the healing. Get healed. Get healed. Stay healed. Walk in divine health. Don't overcomplicate it. Just be a child. Amen. Thank you for joining us for the preaching of God's Word. We trust that your faith and your love for God is stronger than ever before. Chaz and Joni Stevenson have a New Testament vision of spreading the full gospel of Christ around the world, helping unbelievers meet Jesus Christ, and building strong Christians who can impact their world, and are doing so by preaching the uncompromised Word of God with the power of the Holy Spirit. To join us in that vision, please consider an offering to help with media costs, or an offering to simply show the value of the spiritual things you have received. You may give online by mail, or by phoning in with a credit card. If you're in Houston, Texas, and looking for a good home church, Pastors Chaz and Joni invite you to a spirit-filled, life-changing service at Houston Faith Church, where we're certain you'll experience the love and goodness of God in a real and powerful way. To watch services via live streaming, or for more information about God, Houston Faith Church, or Stevenson Ministries, please visit us on the web, or download our Houston Faith phone app, or catch our Houston Faith TV Roku channel.